out here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week it's going to be the turn-off. We've got a fuzz box and we're going to use it because I recently spoke to their lead singer, songwriter Vix, to find out more about life, love, poetry and all that other groovy stuff. Has had a prolific and a long career in music, starting with the classic album Boston Steve Austin before... Uh, moving on to a major label with the second album, Big Bang, but has had a very prolific solo career with various lineups and has currently got a new single that has just come out. This is with what features Robin George, and the song is going to be titled Summertime Reggae Rule, which is available from all good streaming sites. And probably if you go to the Fuzzbox Facebook page or any of their social media platform sites, you'll find out more. But anyway, this is the interview. So after several minutes of interesting but casual chat, we get down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years. Bix, it's over to you. Do you know, I, I don't know if there was ever one moment because music was so intrinsic in our family. Like, we loved, loved, loved music. Um, we'd, have, <laughs> we'd have Christmas get-togethers with all the cousins and uncles and aunties and stuff. At, we, we used to take it in turns at different people's houses at, at Christmas and we'd have a big sing-along. Like, my uncle plays, you know, banjo and guitar and ukulele. And um, my, my, my dad, I mean... My mum didn't didn't play anything, but they loved singing and beautiful sense of harmony. So it had always been a big thing in our family. Um, trying to think if there's anything that's... I mean, I remember some of my first records were things like the Rubettes, Sugar Baby Love. Uh, love the, yes, the great Rubettes. There was obvious, yes, that was the generation of Shawadi Wadi and uh, Bay City Rollers, wasn't it? And, um, yeah, but my brother broke that in half, my vinyl, and I was not happy. No. Uh, it's younger and much naughtier. Um, I mean, I always loved all of the sort of 50s and 60s, strangely enough, as well. You know, I, and I still do now. I probably, in general, sort of prefer a lot of that kind of music. Like, my mum has dementia and I care for her. And I often take her to um, singing for the brain groups. And I love all that songs. You know, it's like, I love all that music. And we, we sing along to, you know, Elvis and um, songs by the Everly Brothers or by like, all the Phil Spector stuff. So I, I really... You know, I really love all of that. I mean, my teenage years, I think probably where I really felt that maybe I would do music was probably um, Kate Bush and Blondie. Um, right. Yeah, The Kick Inside and Parallel Lines. Because I, yes. I, I had the albums and, of course, album covers were were you know, a treasured thing um, you'd save up for. And then I just remember lying on my bed, you know, sort of the typical lying on your tummy with your feet up, just going through and through the the lyrics and who did what on it and looking at all the artwork. So those were, those those touched me a lot. Yes, because that was, because my first single was, as I mentioned, David Bowie. Second one was Sailing by Rod Stewart. And the third oh. one was Blondie's Deneen, Deneen. Oh, yeah. Because when I saw that and heard her on top of the pops, you know, one had to so lightly rustle up 70p to go to the shop and buy the single. <laughs> and it was just like, wow. And then obviously Parallel Lines was the one that had so many classic songs, including mm. probably my favourite one on side two, which is 1159, which I always thought was such a kind of, um, it just had a great vibe to it. Stay alive, bumping <laughs> like a fugitive. Yes, <laughs> all that. I, I just know every word off by heart. Well, I know, and it just seemed to be that it was telling the story. I'm not sure what about, but it was just very exciting, and I just thought, yeah, Blondie, go for it. So um, I loved it, and also Kate Bush was really huge, <laughs> and all yeah. her stuff that, um, yes, right through into the, I suppose, the 90s, actually, with Red Shoes, which, again, she was just awesome, and... Um, I just find actually one thing I love is watching old video interviews with people like Kate Bush because she was so young when she started and seeing her rehearsing with her dance troupe because she only did one small tour, well, one tour during that time and then that was it. She just went she into the studio. She worked with artist, didn't she? Lindsay Kemp. It was, um, yeah. yes. Oh, so yeah, it's beautiful. It was beautiful. So then as we trucked up to the nine, uh, the 70s, you know, that was 70s, 
79, yes, Thatcher gets in, so there was that moment. And then we had the Falkland War and the miners' strike and then Greenham Common. So did you, because I we got to 1980, I left, I was 16. But, but did you leave school at 16 or did you go on to A-levels or anything drastic like that or college? Well, I went to um, sixth form college, but... Um, I, I'd f- sort of forgotten about this until more recently because we're like, we're like you know like kind of working on writing a book about fuzzbots. And I remembered that the the impetus for fuzzbots was actually because I'd started this band of sorts called the Flying Collars. It was a joke, really. Um, at the last gig that we had at at school, um, and you know it's a grammar school, so it was all kind of violin concertos and classical you know, sort of solo oriatals, whatever. Um, and uh, that's not even a word, I don't think. <laughs> so I, obvious. Um, and I kind of put together this so-called band and, and I was like, yes, but we have to show that people can make music in any way. Not everybody has the, the money to buy expensive equipment or whatever. So we all had things like, you know, shakers that we'd made and um, tins that we banged and just stupid stuff. And we did like a bit of a joke band with that. Um, and that inspired me to 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 think, I, I'm, I'm going to be forming a band. Um, but in that... Yeah, so which happened in, in the holiday straight after I left school. But I thought, well, I better go to sixth form college. Um, and I was studying things like drama, like theatre studies and, and so on. But we were only there. Well, I was only there. I don't know. It's like a, I don't even know if I made the term because right. first spots came along. Um, we kind of invented that and off off we were. I, I, I would have liked to, go, I think, have gone to drama school. The, you know, something like that. I mean, music schools didn't exist. No, they Rage didn't. Was drama schools did. Yes. Um, did you used to go to places like Barbarella's and any kind of interesting clubs during the sort of early 80s? Well, I would have been too young then. Um, <laughs> so, so, but, we, I mean, my sister, both my older sisters went to Rum Rona, Barbara, you know, those kind of places. But um, there were some really cool uh Clubs in in Birmingham. Oh, I was underage, but um, things like Zigzags, Powerhouse, um, Edwards Number Eight. There were some really great places, and because we'd had such a massive scene with the New Romantic, there was still a lot going on. Like the alternative scene in the mid eighties was phenomenal in Birmingham, and we mixed so well. You know, you'd have goths and hardcore punks and rockabillies and hippies and, you know, everyone of every sort of sexuality and gender and colour. And we, it was a massive melting pot. So that was really, it was still very exciting to be part of that. Yes. Did you, at that stage, because there had been people like the Nightingales, mm. had you sort of picked up, because we saw, you know, King King Rocker with uh, Stuart oh. Lee. Did you, um, you obviously, you have seen the film, haven't you? Yes, yeah. <laughs> was that a good representation of of Birmingham at that stage for those people who were around at that stage at that point in the late seventies? Late seventies. Was... Well, I suppose I suppose the Nightingales began in the the sort of the late seventies, eighties. I wouldn't have been aware of them at that point. I, I, if I'm honest, I don't think I really probably was aware, aware until Rob Lloyd from who, who ran Vindaloo Records and also, of, of course, is a lead singer and songwriter of Nightingales until he approached us about being in, you know, releasing music as Fuzzbox. Yes, quite. Did you then, at that stage, you know, because because you had the punk period and then the sort of post-punk, and as you mentioned, there was New Romantics, there was Goth, there was uh, a bit of Rockabilly, and then the, the indie pop world came along, didn't it, in 83, with people like the Smiths and the June Brides and Yeah, Yeah, No. Did you kind of pick up on that indie scene at all? Was that something that came onto your radar at that point? Yeah, because I think, uh, you know, I was listening to... Um, John Peel quite a lot and Janice Long and John Peel of course was playing things like The Smith so very much listening to that everything but The Girl I loved bands like um, The Sugar Cube not Sugar Cube uh, I'm thinking of Sugar Hiccup by Cocteau Twins oh yes (laughs) Um, it's been a long day Uh, and um, you know 
Yeah, there were some really quirky things around at that point, weren't there? And so a lot of what he played was very interesting. And you know, I started going to gigs really quite young, you know, at 14. All of, like, me and my mates, we loved music. We'd get on coaches and travel all over the place to see um, Sisters of Mercy. Of course, there was The Mermaid, which is pretty legendary in Birmingham. And I saw Gene Loves Jezebel, The Three Johns, um, The Cardiacs, you know, all sorts of just amazing bands around that time. Yes. Well, it was quite... I think the 80s did have... A, was slightly lucky in the sense of... Um, it doesn't seem it... It wasn't felt... It didn't feel like that at the time, but having quite a lot of high unemployment and then the Conservative government brought in things like the Job Seekers Allowance and Enterprise Allowance Schemes. A lot of people were like, oh, I'm on the dole, but I just need to do this and then I can... Stay still claim the benefit but I don't have to go and um, do any restart interviews or sign on I can (laughs) say I'm a self-employed musician or flower flower arranger but it was a way of the government making the unemployment figures look better but an awful lot of people went and formed a band you know had that period where they sort of rehearsed played lots and got a single on John Peel then got a John Peel session Mm -hmm. and and every city and town seemed to have an alternative indie night in the country and um, and then we had the music press and obviously John Peel Janice Long Kid Jensen so you know people could get quite a bit of traction in the early days from being like my god how did I suddenly become quite famous on top of you know not top of the pops but the NME and stuff like that yeah, totally. And you know what um, what's, was just wonderful? I mean, I hope it was like this in a lot of cities, but in Birmingham, we had such a lot of support locally. You know, the the local radio stations, the local press, the, you know, um, and, and there were, obviously there were indie labels like Bindaloo who signed Fussbox. There was a, it was, it was easier to find out who did what, even though you would think that social media would make it easier and get in with people and and to move up the up the ladder to have that big support. Um so it's sort of it's it's very sad now that it's not that same scene. It's much harder to to get in. You almost already have to be much more successful and be doing far more yourself to, to get seen. Whereas there, you know, also um you know you'd have talent scouts coming from London, you know, uh, looking for interesting bands and journalists would travel to come and see you if they'd heard that there was something interesting going on. Yes. I don't think a lot of that happens anymore. Well, I think there was those, yeah, I remember John Peel when he used to sort of read out her band's kind of tour schedule and there was those venues, weren't there, like the Princess Charlotte, there was the the Harlow Square, the Norwich Arts Centre, then, you know, each city or town, you know, had one of those very iconic little places that you could guarantee about 150 to 250 people turning up on a Tuesday night <laughs> to see a band for, you know, three, you know, three line-up you know, with bands um, for about £2.50p, you know, it was like, well, you might as well have a punt, you know, because you'd heard John Peel play them, so they must be probably all right. Yeah. And now you you look at the posters now and you think, oh, my God, I wish I'd gone out more now and um, and photographed them as well, because I know I've forgotten quite a lot of bands I saw, but never mind. Yeah, but people d- you didn't photograph everything then. No, this is a huge problem. Photographers would, you know, but if there was a photographer there. But, oh, yeah, I mean... You haven't got the sort of record of everything that we we can get now with our phones. No, this is true. So then, sort of the golden period, the eighties. So then, eighty five. How does how do you sort of then form the fuzz box? How does this all sort of come about? How do the planets line up for this magical moment? Well, as I said, I'd already sort of got this silly band that I'd sort of just put together for the um, end of term concert at the school um, called The Flying Collars. And, and we had some of us sort of thought, oh, yeah, we'd like to form form a band. Um, but as luck would have it, um, we, we were out at the powerhouse and dancing around and one of our friends was doing a gig and we were always supporting you know any local bands and we are the bang sisters this was and they said are you going to come along say yeah yeah definitely who's supporting it who's supporting you who's your support band and it said oh don't know we haven't got we haven't got one couldn't you know if you know of any and we were like oh yeah we'll we'll do it even though we weren't a band we hadn't like you know sort of put anything together and Maggie um didn't go to school with, with us because she was five years older she's Joe's sister um so we just kind of got together on the afternoon before the gig and cobbled together three songs and um that was that 
Blimey. So what was, what was your songwriting process at this stage? Can you remember the three songs, by the yes, way? Yes, I can. So we did um, Fever, kind of, you know, Peggy Lee, Elvis. Yes. But, but again, i have done this as the flying colours, and it was all kind of, woo, 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 all kind of thing. Oh, my dog's looking at me like a man. <laughs> um, so it was a bit different. And then we did... Um, Oh, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So, I was, Because I'd managed to con the lovely music teacher. Um, she was so sweet and very posh. And, uh, you know, I was doing Twinkle, Twinkle, you know, singing it all really nice. But then I hadn't shown her the next bit, which went, oh, I don't know. And we were pogoing, well, at least I was, around the, set, the stage and going nuts. And, and the, of course, the, the people had gone crazy when it was at the school. So we did a stupid version of that. And then somehow I'd written this poem um, called Console Me. And I was actually a very chirpy child in, in the, most of the time. Um, but it's like, you know, about being in a dark room, black room, swirling round. So it actually fit quite well for that sort of gothic thing. And I made that into a song. That was it. That was the three songs. The That's three songs. And Console Me ends up on... Um... Yes, Boston Steve Austin, doesn't yeah. it? Yes, and actually Fever does as well. My God, so, and did you, and did the sound, I mean, was the sound of the band, um, how did they get that together? Was it sort of based on their musical skill or musical limitation at that stage? <laughs> More limitation, let's be honest. Um, so I'd always sung, I'd always loved singing. Um, Joe was quite naturally musical, really. Well, she's very musical, nat naturally musical. She'd had a few guitar lessons, so she knew a few chords. Um, that might have been it. Maybe Tina had had a couple of keyboard, uh, sorry, um, sax lessons, and Maggie had played like piano but I mean a lot of that wasn't really that relevant to what we were doing and uh so no one had played drums no one had played bass we'd not played together as a proper band you know with instruments and and so on but we borrowed a load of instruments that was Maggie's boyfriend had he was in a really experimental band called the Family Patrol Group and they just had lots of strange things I like had a violin that you put through an effects pedal so it's right. like, oh, that sounds fun let's put that through some reverb and delay and woo. um and you know a fuzz box da -da. and so we're like oh, that's, that sounds cool let's put the bass through that so we just really cobbled it together but in some ways our you know, the, the limitations actually created the sound that we were. It was very DIY, as you can hear. Yes, well, I, I think I did an interview <laughs> with a member. I did a member of uh, interview with a member of the was it Big Flame actually? I think that was again. I think they had one musician who knew what they were doing, and the rest were just like, "Actually, we don't." So we're just going to make this. No, we couldn't do a cover version of anything because we're not that skillful, but we can make this sound. And um, off they went, and um, yes, became darlings of John Peel for uh, at least yeah. one year. So then, after that gig, did you all sit there thinking, "This is a great idea. I can see a future here." I oh, just thought it was a laugh. Thought it was hilarious, really. Um, the others got very, very nervous about going on stage. I, I didn't particularly. For me, it was just like, just fun and not normal. Um, but we decided to do a second. Well, we were asked to do a second gig. It was there was no plan, but we were asked to do a second gig, and that was when Rob Rob Lloyd from the Night of Girls and Vindaloo Records came along because he'd heard that there was this all girl band and he thought, well, that's great. I'm interested in that. I'll go and see. He was actually going to poach some musicians. He thought it'd be great to have some female mu musicians in his band. Yes. Um, however, he came along and thought, oh, perhaps not. Um, I don't think that they're quite what I was talking about, but he loved us as we were. He loved like the that you know we were swapping instruments we'd be like well i haven't played drums yet i want to go it was all a bit like that it was Blimey. just playing literally playing not really anything too serious and he yeah he liked us as we were so signed us up to vindaloo to release oh, that's that's very um he is a gambling man isn't he he likes horse racing <laughs> so he obviously saw some magic there which was quite incredible but i mean alan mcgee's got various stories a bit like that going to see people I think when he signed Oasis, he couldn't remember in the morning. Someone said, you, you do know you've signed a band. He'd gone to Glasgow to see, I think he, he went to the to see one band and Oasis was either supporting or something, yeah. but he wasn't. Oh. And then he signed them and then in the morning woke up from an alcoholic haze and went, oh God, have I signed them? I mean, <laughs> rock and roll was quite different in those days, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. So then did you, at that stage, 
he weren't at college and probably didn't have a, I say, didn't have a day job you might have done. Did you then think, God, you know, let's make an album? Was it that kind of... I, I, was, I, was, at col- I was at college by then, because I think that was around sort of October that we were making, actually recording. So this was October uh, 85? Yeah, yeah. So I'd started sixth form co- college then. Um, and, well, it, the single went out. It was like as a... Uh, with rules and regulations and um, XX sex and so on, and it just it did, it, you know, did a lot better than we expected. Um, Vintage Records printed up a thousand vinyls; they sold out. Did another thousand; they sold out, and it kept going on and on like that. I mean, we'd have probably sort of got quite a decent way up the charts had we been able to just put them all out in one go. But it was a bit of a let's punt it out there and see how, see what happens. So, yes. Yeah. So. Um, and then, because it was going well, with um, we did an album. So, with the songwriting, because obviously you you know you have to sort of expand it slightly. Did you just, as a band, just go into rehearsal and just keep sort of knocking out different ideas, different songs? Who was the songwriter, by the way? Who did the lyrics? I um, I wrote most of the the songs. Um, well, not, uh, we didn't write that many necessarily. All. Thinking on our own, yeah. Actually, Maggie and I sort of wrote most of it. I wrote the the vast majority. So someone had perhaps come along. Um, Joe might have a bass line or a guitar riff, or I might come with a set of lyrics and a melody, or Maggie might have uh, some lyrics and a and melody as well. So it just kind of come along. So it would really vary. We were always open to anything really that anyone brought along. Yes. So. Yeah, I don't know, just... And then, uh, at that sort of winter, the winter of 85, 86, you get a John Peel session as well. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) crazy. What was was that experience? Did you... Who was the producer? Was it Dale Griffin from What the Who? I think it was. I think it was, yeah. Yes, God, was that a good experience? Because that one, what did you put on it? You put Fever, you put Rules and Regulations, Justin, and uh, Don't Let Us Die, arg. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> Actually, Tina wrote that one, as, <laughs> which is one of hers. Um, yeah, we did some stupid stuff on the John Peel sessions. We did, like, just... You know, sudden, I just suddenly burst into things, like stupid voices and cover songs, like... Of let's go to San Francisco. You know, <laughs> I just oh, stupid this. We often ended up with really silly things, and I mean, it, it kind of came from when we were live on stage. Things would always go wrong, partly because you know we, I don't know, we we forgot the song, or the team would play the drums too fast, or because the amps would explode or we'd get electric shocks or the sound would go down. Anything that could happen would happen to fuzzballs. And so I, I just in- instantly was like, oh, what shall I do? Oh, I'll sing an Elvis song. Oh, I'll do a, I'll do a tap dance to the Red Red Robin. Like, just bonkers. Yes. Like, what I was doing? <laughs> well, I was very ambitious to do a version of Bohemian Rhapsody as well. <laughs> you see, the first one, I think, was quite funny. It was re created later later on and it was well, it was it was never never as funny as when you just do it stupidly and you know spontaneously really is it? this is this is true so what studio did you go to to record boston steve austin we were at um rich bitch in birmingham so the same place that we started the the first single so i mean it was great i mean it's, it's a shame it's it's it closed um but it was a an amazing place for a long time we even did some um, a bit of like band work with Horace Panther from the specials and Fuzz Townsend. Oh, in God, the Fuzz. Yeah, yes. from Football Eats itself, Bentley with the Mason, of course, Car SMS. So, yeah, we did have other, um, and there's a drummer called um, Jim. I forgot his surname now. He, um, so, we had other people kind of working with us at times as well. And, um, yeah, which was really fun. Just kind so of. When you when you heard it back, were you? I mean, because I actually went and bought the album. Well, there you go. I still have it. Hey. I have. And um, did, were you really amazed and pleased with it at this stage when you sort of heard the results of it, or were you a bit like Ian Curtis from Joy Division? Went, oh my god, you've destroyed it. This is terrible. <laughs> were no, you pleased? We, yeah, we were pleased. I mean, obviously, we knew that there were like mistakes, sorts of things, or it wasn't you know, perfect, it, it, but we didn't care really at that stage. I think it was just, 
it, we were really happy. Just we were just going along with the the journey. Yes, well, it was we one, one amazing journey. Words. Yeah, we weren't over analysing or anything. We were just just enjoying it and having fun. I mean, most of our rehearsals were basically on stage because we'd get another gig and another gig and another, and we just were sort of like cobble together something you know the afternoon before or something and then have a go at doing that song live even though we weren't proficient musicians yes but we learned really fast we learned really fast well yes you you packed a lot <laughs> in doing that track and i remember because i used to always record the john peel show on a trusty tdk d90 cassette and listen to it several times because when you listen to new music, it's hard to sort of appreciate it on the first listen. And um, I do remember John reading out a letter that one of the members or the band had written to him, which was quite, I remember him reading it out, and it was quite funny. Can you remember writing a letter to John Peel and him? Oh my gosh, no, we need that. I can, I can just remember. Oh, no, I'm, making, I'm making a note of this. We're going to need to find <laughs> this out. I, I just, I can remember because I used to do. Oh, thank you, remember. Yes, and he wrote, I'm sure, you know, there must be some archive of, yeah. you know, because people put these John Peel shows up and him reading out a letter from the fuzz box and it was it was done, I just, you know, I wish I could, um, yes, but it must have been 86. Yeah, yeah but, I do kind of remember it, but I don't remember. And it was just oh, kind of, you called him something really cute and silly and he read it out and it was quite amusing and, yeah, you know, at the, at the time it was good. And also you made videos which were very much of, a, of its time, didn't you? Lots of running about. Why were we always running? Um, yeah, I, I I always loved making videos. I really enjoyed it. I lo I love the visual side of things as well as the audio. So yeah, it was good. yes, I did have an NME. I don't know VHS compilation that they brought out, which I'm vaguely looking to see if it's on my shelf. But that was um, I was just wondering if you were on it. It was something I think it was a band of Bond one with like twenty or thirty videos of people from you know the indie world. But I can't see it next to me. But I should have rehearsed that, shouldn't I? But you were on the famous NME C86 cassette, which Woo! just which which at the time when Neil Taylor and the other two put it together. I mean, they'd been bringing out those cassettes and they were probably just vaguely um, successful. But this one went stratospheric, I think, if that's the word. It was very successful, basically, wasn't it? Did that sort of also give you a, a bounce in your career at this stage? It definitely did. Yeah, it was, it was, it was something else to be on, wasn't it, that people would get to hear you that wouldn't have ordinarily and it had a lot of backing from the NME. So, uh, yeah, really, really cool. We felt very credible. <laughs> very, 22, 22 bands. And then the other um, purchase I must have made at that time was your collaboration with dear old Ted Chippington as well. So yeah. how did this How did this one come together? Because, again, you know, I even got the, I, I don't know, it was a 12-inch, which I do have somewhere still. But, um, yes, how did this, this come? Because you obviously, 86 to 87, you, you know, you must have been working 24-7 on this band. We were really busy. So I, I, I must have, I'm, I will have left, left college by now and, you know, so, sort of be out, out and about touring and stuff. But the, it's the Vindaloo Summer Special. So it was the Nightingales, Ted Chippington and us, the first box. And we, we did a whole tour with it. Honestly, it was one of the best tours ever 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 and i even now i'll bump into people and they might sort of say god you know that was the best gig i ever went to or the best tour it was just so fun and i'm pretty sure we alternated between the nightingales of who would headline um ted chippington would always be sandwiched in the middle so you had this you know alternative comedy show i mean he was one of like the first alternative comedians. yes really was um and then at the very end, we'd all get on stage and do Rocking with Rita, which was the um the the joint song that we did to get Rocking with Rita, head to toe. Um, and we you know Rocking with the fuzz box. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Rocking yeah. with Elvis. <laughs> and with with wear, you know, like all the sort of summer, for like 50s summer bathing costumes, and we'd throw out inflatable balls. My I still love it, throwing inflatables to, to my crowds. I, I yes, well, it's got to be done. <laughs> It was magical. It was a nice was, bit in, yeah. in the film with Rob talking about his life and then Bindaloo Records, which obviously he hadn't realised the fuzz box were going to be quite so incredibly 
successful, I guess. I mean, no one does. I think I was listening to an interview with um, Suzanne Vega and they were still recording that first album thing. They might sell five or 20,000 copies of the album, you know, and still doing a few more vocal takes with Lenny Kay. And um, little did she know it was going to be one of these million, pa- in million selling albums, which was going to change the face of her her life and um, various other things as well. So yes, did it? Um, so where, as as sales started to accumulate, how did um, yes, how did that feel as as a sort of a musician that had only been in the started the band only less than twelve months? Uh, everything was always kind of we were always very down to earth, really. So when this stuff was happening, we we never kind of went, ooh, aren't we fantastic and kind of got above ourselves. Um, it was always a bit of a laugh, really. Um, and, we, and we started touring Europe quite quickly as well. So we went to Belgium really early on and then to um, the Netherlands and Germany. So, you know, we were sort of, we were out, we were just out being busy and it wasn't very glamorous. You know, there wasn't a lot of money at that time. So we were still, um, you know, living it a little bit rough because in those days you were allowed to be in the back of a transit van without any sort of seats or seat belts. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You used to be absolutely battered by amps falling on your head and squashing up against each other and you you know oh it's so uncomfortable and then you'd have to get up the next day at the crack of dawn so it was it was very very rock and roll yes I think most people during that period talk about the sort of horrendous food and um yes (laughs) especially when they're playing in the middle of winter it was um quite hard work actually was there a particular country because often I find with what indie bands or just bands there is one country it really takes to them sometimes they go oh Italy we're big in Italy or we were quite big in Holland for a while was there any particular country that sort of took the fuzz box to their heart the first trip abroad was Belgium went on Belgian TV which was you know we just got the boat over performed and came back so that was quite nice but I mean I would say that um yeah Holland and, and Germany took to us quite quickly which was really nice yeah. yes yeah and then sort of 87, you know, the drastic year, really, isn't it? Um, this, Because I often put indie pop down between the years of 83 to 87. That basically the years of the Smiths. And then things change. Then the world of ecstasy, there's a new wave of 16, 18-year-olds appearing and they want their sort of soundtrack. And then you had the, the dance scene and then you had people like a guy called Gerald and 808 State and... And then eventually, you know, the, the boss, uh, not the Boston, the um, the Seattle grunge scene. So, how did you, how what's the post Boston Steve Austin like for the band? Because then you have to make those decisions of what what to follow that that classic album up with. Yeah, I mean, so eighty seven, we were still very busy touring and so on. So eighty eight, we'd have been kind of quietening down and looking at what we do next. It was really hard, actually, if I'm honest. You know, after. Boston Steve Austin and you know and the singles we released with that and that success and it was that was all so easy you know because it wasn't a lot of thought that went into it in some ways it was just really creative and spontaneous and you know didn't worry about song structures particularly or sounds of things we just whacked it all out and we were already on a major as such we were on WEA which is part of the Warners and and we're on Warner Chapel for publishing um, but we had like a, an intermediary with with Vindaloo, and then um, the major bought us bought us out. well well bought us out uh, as far as I am aware. Uh, it's strange, but really, because I kind of caught up with Rob some time ago. And we were always under the impression, I, or let me speak for myself, yes, that. that um, you know, WA must have paid for Vindaloo a fortune to take uh, take us, and and I, um, although we were really flattered and excited about being on a major, there was also that sort of real sadness and that concern of like losing our creative control and and so on. But it become too big for Vindaloo as it stood. In hindsight, I absolutely wish somehow. Um, you know, the major could have funded the independent more and we could have continued with that route, really. It was, it was I think that would have been phenomenal. Yes, um, it's it's a tricky old number, isn't it? And there's, there's a lot of musicians I've interviewed who just, you know, like a record label 
gets bought up by another and then another. So they have no idea where their master tapes are and who owns it. And, you know, I think, you know, people now kind of being quite frustrated and thinking, I really want to get my archives sorted out and, and <laughs> sort of get that dusted down because it seems really, I suppose, unfair because it just um, it just seems like a mad world, doesn't it, music and ownership and publishing and all that kind of malarkey so yeah um, i think for, uh, for me and it's, it's a lot of it was the personnel and the creative input and and control really uh but i guess it had just got too too big it yes got gone too sort of mainstream as such and it was difficult then to find our sounds and to write together because we'd all grown up so much i mean um maggie was like five is it was well, five years older than the rest of us, so I wouldn't. I don't think she'd necessarily change quite as much. But when you're fifteen, yes. you, you know, even a few years can be pretty massive. And I definitely wanted like more guitars and loved all the harmony stuff. Um, and then someone else would perhaps be into like um, disco or you know real pure pop or indie or it, it was just it was really hard to find the sound yes um, we worked with lots of different producers and did lots of different stuff and in the end we kind of decided to go for that pop spoof you know that we could all kind of have fun with and it'd be very tongue-in-cheek and so that's... who was your producer on that album there seems to be a lot of engineers and and different um on big bang but of, yes, a big bang. Um, so Andy Richards, so he was one of the Trevor Horn boys as such. Um, there was talk, we were going to go with Trevor Horn, but we'd have had to wait quite a long time. And it was our choice. We we thought, you know, not that bothered about the name. We just want to get cracking. And we really liked a lot of what Andy Richards had done because he'd done, um, actually done quite a lot with Rush, but I don't know if we'd heard that at that point. Um, oh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. I think there was some Pet Shop Boys in Dusty Springfield. Um, and we'd worked with lots of other producers and just for some reason or other, it just didn't quite... Jam. Yes. It's it's strange because actually he was in, didn't realise he was in in the Straubs, which was quite one of those sort yeah. of quite serious bands. Yeah, it was mainly, sort of... it was like a keyboard place. He played with all sorts like George Mike and so on. I mean, we, one of the producers we worked with was actually Hugh Cornwell and I really liked him and I loved what we were doing. Um, me and Tina particularly liked that side because it was a little bit edgier and a little bit more, yeah, sort of um, got that more rocking sort of punky indie vibe to it slightly. Yes. But, um, the record company didn't like it. Didn't he said it? no, no to who? Did um? So did you have a manager at this point? Was that Patsy Winkleman? At yeah, this we point? had Patsy almost all the way through. Really. Oh, was she your guide and light? Um, I'm really grateful that we had Patsy. I'm really, really fond of Patsy. And she was a teacher at the time and Rob Lloyd's girlfriend. And I think it was like, God, somebody needs to look after these girls and sort them out. Yes. And Maggie was sort of taking the bookings and things initially. And so, uh, yeah, it was great because she was, you know, oh, God, I don't even know how tall she was, about five foot, but she was a feisty, really smart woman, you know, really political and right little feminist and she wouldn't let any, you know, anyone mess us up. Excellent. Something. Yeah, she yeah. Need, yeah need nice. That. So when you got those track listings together, did that take a while? Did you sort of have to work on that quite a bit before going into the studio to record them? Because there's quite a, um, yeah, there's, some, there's a sort of a sound, but there's also a couple of tracks which are quite different to the rest of the album. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, were, we did write a few with um, Liam Sternberg, who wrote, Walk like an Egyptian, so that, that we were kind of um, offered him, and we got on great with him. He's fantastic, very eccentric American. So um, there's a few. Pink Sunshine was co-written with him. International Rescue, um, a, a couple of others. So, but the rest were all written by us. Yes, one of my favourite songs on the album um, is Irish. Bride was that um, ah. whose idea? Because I think it was a lovely vocal. It's a beautiful arrangement, and I've always loved the lyrics. Actually, so I know it's completely unlike the rest of the album. But that was um, was that one that was written by the band? No, so Maggie um, and Joe were from you know Irish um, background, and so Maggie wrote the 
the lyrics and I you can kind of I think hear the Kate Bush influence for me so I kind of um, Kate Bush it up with the melody. Yes. That was a co-write between us two. I like, you know, I, I think a lot it was of just... people like that. It's beautiful. It's just a really nice song. And then obviously you had your big hit with International Rescue, which the budget for the video, was that quite eye-watering? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I don't know how it would compare with stuff now because, of course, you know, things got even more expensive after, and now you can do things for cheap, can't you? Yes. It's 30 grand, which at the time was a ludicrous budget. And, of course, we had um, uh, Adrian Edmondson directing and starring in it, so that's that's what it cost, really. That's that's how it was. I really enjoyed making... It looks thing. like a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was but I think, poor guy, he didn't realise how long it would take for girls to be sort of made up and stuff and we ended up with so little time to actually perform because I mean all we could would do is sit there you know, being done so you know the makeup and the hair people and stuff would be doing all their thing so it took just forever so we yes. didn't end up with much time to actually do the performance and when and when the release came out were you kind of pleased with it or was it sort of kind of mixed with the band and yourself of the, the sound of the track or the... Well, no, the whole album. Did it sort of feel... Because it's such a different album. You know, I got it, but it's such a different... It has a, such a different vibe to Boston Steve Austin, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. Looking looking back, you know, I mean, I'd have... I mean, I thought we were going to end up with more guitars, if I'm not honest. Because I was going to say, when will we we'll be adding the guitars? And when will Joe be coming and doing some more stuff? It was a bit like that, but it did run away with us somewhat. But we were very interested in production by that time, you know, and using the fair light and all. I found it quite fascinating. I mean, I would happily sit in the studio for like hours and hours while um, Andy, the producer, and the engineers would just sit and be fiddling with different sounds and layering things up and chopping. And I, I used to love being part of, like, compiling vocals and yeah. I loved doing the harmony. So I think we got quite interested in technology by then. So there was that. Um, you know, and, and I think it was for what, what we wanted to do, it, it was kind of our best option because we nowadays it might be easier um, to mix all our different styles. But I mean, I remember saying to people things like, we want quite hard, like kind of rocky, danceable drums with some guitar, fuzzy guitar. Mm. Gotta have fuzzy guitar, but with like soft, pretty vocals and some, you know, lots of harmony. No, you can't do that. Oh, well, what genre is that? Well, it'll just be our own. No. You're going to, you know, you're, you're going to be pop, you're going to be rock. You're going to be into it. Was, everything was ever so pigeonholed. And I'm sure somehow we could have broken the mould and just mixed all those things that we all love together and be. Yes. It just didn't seem possible. They didn't Cause seem... Because a couple of years, because I did an interview with a producer who did the, who kind of shaped the 90s, because he did those ones with... Um, well, he did the first Red Hot Chili Peppers album, which was like, my God, what the hell's that? What, what have you oh, done? Yeah. Got funk and rock. And then he did Soul Asylum and Soundgarden and Hole. And basically that, those kind of slightly heavy, but they'd always do a, a heartfelt uh, ballad and, you know, lots of vocal, you know, lots of kind of, um, yeah, it had that kind of dramatic rock sound but with heartfelt vocals really mm -hmm. um so yes you were probably a bit ahead of your time i would imagine the album could have been big in america did it sort of do any yeah, any yeah it was out with geffen and we weren't allowed to be called we've got a fuzz box and we're going to use it because they thought that was very rude so <laughs> right, <laughs> had to just be fuzz box there um and uh, yeah so uh, I mean, we never really lost the name. We've got a fuzzbots, and we've got, we're going to use it. It's just it's a mouthful. So fuzzbots was like the um, nickname in a way. But yeah, America. Weren't. I suppose it's a bit like Frankie goes to Hollywood, isn't it? You just say Frankie, and then people know what you're talking about. So did that when that album came out? Did you tour with it at all? Did it? Did you go on tour with this? Oh, that's something that I was going to say. I think that's one of the things I think that annoyed us the most about. Um, Doc is trying to jump up. That it, it sort of it was annoying that. We really wanted to tour with with um, Big Bang, 
but because we were getting so much promotion, I mean, it was great in one in, in many ways. You know, we were on the front cover of Smash It and Enemy on the same week. Yeah. So it was it was great that we had that pop mainstream um you know appeal as well as indie and cool. I mean, that was just brilliant. And and we were always on Saturday morning TV, which was such good fun. We loved it. Um, you know, so we were always in the press and always on TV and so on. But we were like, yeah, but when are we going to tour? We really like, <laughs> we need yes. to tour this album. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, oh, so, yeah, oh, there's not, there was never time. And we barely got time off. I mean, we didn't have a holiday for God knows how long or even like, you know. I remember we were supposed to have like two weeks off and then ends up a week off just about because you know, there's always another interview. So it was, it was really heavily pushed. Yes. Um, but not toured, actually. Well, eventually we went to the Far East and toured. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, oh, my God. Oh. Were you big in Japan? Yeah. Excellent. I absolutely fell in love with Japan. I think a lot of things changed for me there as well. Um, we went to um, Hong Kong, Singapore, and quite a lot of Japan. Um, and I think it's the first time I actually really enjoyed going abroad, like gigging and stuff. I, I, I guess I was a bit older because I used to get so homesick. Really, really homesick. I like really loved my family. Didn't like being away, um, but I sort of got a bit more independence, and I loved the culture, and um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. The only thing was that we were only allowed to perform to backing tracks, and I absolutely insisted at least I sang live, so I could do that. So yes. it was more, but I guess that's really popular now, and sometimes still do that with Fuzzbox gigs. So it's that PA kind of thing, right? So that was, Fun. And they were a great audience, you know. They really were, and I liked it because you perform earlier as well. And it was, it was, it was fab. Actually, but there's some nice. amazingly obscure indie bands who could barely get a hundred. 150 people at you know Norwich Art Centre, but then go to Japan and like, who, who, why, who are all these people waiting for? Like, they're waiting for you, you know. Like, yeah. what? We've never played in a place that big before. It's like, no, you're really mad, and they know all your lyrics. And it's like, oh my god. Yeah. So um, it's strange. Sarah Records, which is uh, quite a smallish label, they they love. They were you know that label were very big in Japan. It's very strange. And the oh. bands like the Wild Swans have got a massive following in the Philippines and. Um, Fill your boots. So it's very strange, you know, it's like almost royalty. Did you, I mean, did you ever find out what the sales were between Boston, Steve Austin and Big Bang? Was there I, any... I was thinking that earlier. I, I haven't, you know, I ought to have a look. It would be oh, really yeah. interesting to see indie versus major at this stage. I, I mean, I can't remember whether we got a gold or a platinum with um, Big Bang. I don't remember. I don't even know. I mean, I should know these things, but... <laughs> yes, a lot of I people. Guess. It's all about that. Like, we got these, you know. This we sold this many, and we, uh, you know, we're in the charts for this long. Blah blah. blah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so you got, got. Did you ever play any festivals like Glastonbury or anything like that? Yes, in '87 we played the John Peel stage. Oh my God! So you were I there know. with. Oh no! Wonderful. And it was I... great because. I mean, we looked ridiculous. Well, or at least I did. Um, of course, then it was a proper, proper hippie fest. It was. That it was, was my really... first. That, that was my first ever. Fe Glastonbury was eighty seven. I was hoping to see Husker Du, but they played oh, at four. Man. They put, played at four o'clock on the Friday afternoon. I missed them. We um, were there. You were there. You were there. Yeah. yeah. Eighty seven. It, it was very bizarre because we. Um, you know, it, was, it was proper hippie fest, so it was a CND, like it was a peace festival. Absolutely. There. And you could leave anything. You could have your tent and you could leave your cameras, your money, everything. No one, no one would touch it. You just knew you trusted everyone. Um, and, and there it was, this hippie fest. And I decided to wear a, a silver tinsel wig, you know, and silver tin, like eyelashes, and I've got things drawn all over my face, and we've got these tutus. And we walked out on stage, and there's almost like this sort of sharp intake of breath because like, we looked alien we looked she looked like from out of space and then all these people are all earthy and nice and in there you know I, we did. but we did win, win them over i we would imagine i think it was the year they had that was it stonehenge made out of cars around that sort of area mm. of the festival i remember that was quite something i was always a bit surprised because i just walked onto the festival site and the amount of people trying to sell drugs was like <laughs> yeah. That's that's quite open and free, but um, yes, it was it was very hippie and um, people just laying in the mud. I just remember thinking, <laughs> do you do that all the time? Are you not going to get cold? Um, but it was very people were so wrecked. I was like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> so yes, oh, I'm glad you played for Glastonbury. 
you were probably on some cosmic ley line. It would have helped with your silver <gasps> gear. It would be beautiful. <laughs> the St. Michael's ley line running across Britain. Um, so then as the 90s, you know, and, the th- and yeah, the end of Thatcher, the John Major years. So what was it like? Because we'd had Nevermind, which was obviously a big moment in, in musical moments. I, actually, that was 91. So we hadn't really had, we, we'd had Bleach by Nirvana, but not Nevermind. So what was it like sort of then trying to think about the third album? Was that ever on the cards at this stage? Yeah, we, we, we sort of were writing stuff and I think that we'd become all we four girls had become quite unhappy really by then in the main. Um I always enjoyed being like a pop star more than any of the others. I it's I always wanted to be like an entertainer, whether that was gonna be, you know, acting, singing, whatever. I just I always loved performing and you know but the others really didn't enjoy it as much at all they didn't like the I, mean, I can't say we always enjoyed being like spotted everywhere even when you're really knackered and you've got no makeup on and you feel yes. like just want some space but other than that yeah the others weren't so keen on like the posing for photos and uh, you know that kind the, the dressing up in costumes and things so I think we'd all got a bit things weren't weren't so great really uh we did we did start writing and in fairness i think we wrote some quite good songs um like i wrote you and your loss mm-hmm. um and i think uh, your loss my game i think they're good songs we just we worked with producers like leroy gorman from bow wow wow um and i don't know the, the record company didn't really like it that much to be honest and we were struggling to find a direction together. Oh, actually, this was, yeah, again, it was sort of like, well, can't we do some, you know, sweet vocals and girly sort of vocals, but with, you know, rocky d- drums and guitar? And again, it was like, mm, well, what, where are you going with this? What, what's your direction? It was, um, you can't go off and do that. Yeah. And, and, and we didn't have as much control as we'd have liked. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of... The writing. It, so was that Lee? Was that Lee? For, who was the bass player on Bow Wow? Yeah, he was great. He was lovely. He is such an. It took me about five years to get an interview with him, and eventually oh. I didn't. And he was so easy. I thought it's amazing, but he obviously was just busy. <laughs> but he was a. Uh, he was just such a lovely guy. Yeah, he was fantastic. He really was. He was yeah. great. I mean, you know, the stuff was was all right. I think that. Yeah, I, I guess it was never going to be like Pink Sunshine. Uh, um so that was a that was a difficulty really and yeah so i mean i'd say that a lot of it was you know musical differences that that broke us up in in the main and uh it was a bit of a shame because actually you would have probably if you just stuck out another couple of years or the various members of the band brit pop would have probably suited you all quite well actually you know i know well i would have liked to have gone more down that road you know sort of um uh, Blumenick, Elastica, Sleeper. I yes, but no, Echo Belly. Yeah. I mean, and also people had got um, really into the whole guitars, indie pop. It was kind of indie pop, mm. but slightly, they were the children of um, your gen- of your your soundtrack, really, wasn't it? I guess, yeah. I guess they were the people who'd gone to see you live when they were young and went, oh, when, we've, when we're at university, we'll form a band and yeah. be, be almost as big as the fuzz box. And then, it, <laughs> oh, God, we're slayed and blurred Hello. and people like that. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, oh, actually, we're on top, you know, we're... Yeah. yeah, so it's yeah, it's a shame. Personally, we weren't as close, you know. Really, a lot of the tensions had, had got had got in the way. Yes. Well. So, well, I think five, four to five years is kind of yeah. it's pretty. Yeah, we got about five years of it, really. And that's yeah. I don't know how you kind of work it. Really, it's just one of those things. I guess actually, it's it's people dropping out, and then other people saying, "Well, we'll keep it going and just see if anything happens with a few new members." We did release your loss, my gain. Did you? Um, and it what we were we were on um pops, we were on top of the pops with that. We were certainly on some TV shows with that. I mean, later on, I actually re-recorded some of that stuff with um, Robin George, um, who I've just released a single. Yes, but he's he passed away a couple of months ago. And we, I know that's um, some that's song. a bit harder. So then we went. So what happens then? Do you for you in the nineties? Do you then just Go back to trying to pick your, you know, get back onto some path in life, or is it a, <laughs> a tricky? Is it kind of quite hard to navigate? Because I know quite a few people have just told me that it was like, God, it's really weird, you know, 
especially people who've been in the band for like 10 years, you know, a member of Mega City 4 was saying they just kind of didn't know what they were doing for about a year and a half. They just were completely lost. So I didn't know what it was like for you to sort of then work out what to do next. It was weird because, you know, although it wasn't as long, it's like five years, but that's, you know, like from 15 to 20 sort of thing. That's a major part of your life, isn't it? And when I look back, I, I would not change it. I, I think it's an amazing way to, to spend my teenage years. Um, but it was it was like, at first, to be honest, I, I just wanted to get away from it and do my own stuff. Um, I'd already started to work with Rob and George <clears throat> on the Fuzzbox stuff. And again, um, I liked it. It was, all, it was guitar and it was intelligent music. It was it had a, maybe a bit of a bluesy vibe. I, I, he recognised my voice. I didn't have to keep shouting and pushing. I could just sing. Like, yeah. you know, and it recognised I was actually a good singer and songwriter. So I carried on working with him. Um in hindsight, I probably went too far down the rock end then because I went against the pop thing and went really rock, which maybe a lot of, some of it doesn't didn't perhaps suit me as well. But I had some fun doing it, and I just wanted to get away from the music business because they kept sending me horrible, horrible songs. They wanted me to go solo and do just awful, awful songs, you know, like standing on a beach singing in my bikini, singing, you know. I mean, I can still remember some of the songs they sent me. Yes. I love Marco, Luigi, Franco, and whatever. They're the guys I even do. It was, oh, some awful things. That's how they saw me. Mm. And I didn't want to be seen in that way. No, absolutely. <laughs> but then, I just remember, then got a compilation, Fuzz and Nonsense. Was this the band? And I think I've got a copy which has all been signed by the members. This was on Yeah Records, wasn't it? Was this... um? the band putting together your archives again. What was the kind of story behind that one? I know the stuff that's, that went, lots of stuff went out on Cherry Red Records. A lot of it, quite a bit, I had nothing to do with. Like there was one look at the hits on that and it had like, um, you know, a pair, a pair of somebody's boobs. It, I have to say that is one of the worst covers of all time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I agree. I hate it. I was it, a bit, it, I was a bit so shocked. Possible. Yeah. Well, other, like... other people involved that I would not have um, fraternised with. It's so not Fuzzbox. And the and the CD overlay was like a thong. Like, And I was like, this is like a Ibiza. Nasty. No. Yeah, it was, it was weird. Yeah, yeah. I know. There's, I just, I just, I didn't want to really kind of go back there. I wanted to move on because I always knew I wanted to sing and write songs yeah. and good stuff. So I... I was off on my own, kind of. It was journey. nice that Cherry Red put out your BBC sessions and those yes, other. Yes, that was that was great. And, Cher and Cherry Red are quite decent, but yes, the um, yes, it was a very confused. Mm. That was a very. Yeah, I was, that was, the, yeah, that was, I was a bit confused comment. by that because I hadn't heard much, and then it was like, okay, that's interesting, <laughs> a bit weird. Then you then you have a sort of you get back to your is it Americana? You start doing sort of much more sort of, uh, ban not banjo. It's ukulele, don't you? That's that's quite a bit further on, but yes, I think a lot of the music I was doing with Rob and George, like the solo stuff with him, um, and we briefly had a had a band called Opposite X as well. Um, that was quite. I love Americana. I love it, like blues and um, bluegrass and rockabilly and all that earthy kind of country and stuff, folk and stuff. So yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a band much later on, Vix and Her Mischiefs which is Americana, got into my ukulele. and Yes. So before that, you brought out an album with Robin George on Angel Air, hadn't you, which is yeah. this one titled You. Yeah. Was um, Love, Power and Peace, was this one of another solo album you put together? Not an album. So that's with Robin as well. He's actually written that song. I think it's a beautiful song. He's recorded it with quite a few different people, uh, Jackie Graham and Ruby Turner. And there's a version with the three of three of us female singers singing it together as well, which is really lovely. So um, I don't know if that's available or if it will be, but it's a really powerful song. So, um, yeah, that was that was nice. But then you came out in 2012 and this is on Angel Air. So was this a kind of project that the two of you worked together or was it his project and you did the vocals? No, um, there were a few that were just his, um, that he'd written. But, yeah, I, I'd written a lot of them and we'd written quite a lot together. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice to be taken seriously as a as a musician, like as a singer and songwriter. 
Yeah, we really, I, I really liked of writing with him. It was quite easy, you know, that we came came up with ideas very easily and complemented each other. I loved his sort of bluesy country guitar. I think it suited my voice well. Yes, absolutely. And then, because it was interesting in the 90s, I used to sort of hang out with a lot of new agey types uh, to people and sort of do sweat lodges and look for ley lines and celebrate the full moon. You you also get quite a sort of, you also have a, a sort of path in the world of sort of healing and, and, and Reiki, don't you? So did this start sort of in the 90s or a bit later on? I think I've always been interested. My dad was a, a tree hugger. I mean, he was right. a headmaster, like he was a proper person. But um, we always loved nature. It is, it's always been part of me. And I think being in the music business, um, I, I, and I, 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 I mean, it was really, really tough at times. Um, I ended up with, well, anorexia um, and had a lot of issues on, on my health, sort of the health front. And that made me get interested in nutrition and um you know your well-being and relaxation and that sort of thing i mean that was early on that was certainly before i went to the far east and i think that was part of it as well um maybe 18 eight ish or so right the already getting quite into that holistic idea of well-being um and i think that's why i enjoyed going to the far east more because i was healthy i was well um in, in myself as well yes so, yeah and, and I was I mean obviously skipping to sort of more recent times I've got my own little business happy life and I do yeah well I know it's an amazing website actually that has, yeah. has sound therapy and sound healing which is do, do you do gong baths by any chance oh god you know I absolutely need a gong in my life you need a so gong badly need a massive gong uh yeah I love to I mean I've got some singing bowls and chimes and um uh, tuning forks and things so I know I'm very into frequencies um and I've got music that I'm working on I've got a whole al- album actually a mantra album that I've been working on which is kind of sound healing as well as another album I'm working on yes so what's um, the yeah, I do coaching sorry uh, coaching um, reiki EFT tapping crystals chakras all of that stuff love it the whole po- yes no absolutely it's all it's all very important stuff was there any particular teacher or book that sort of helped you or has always been your sort of guide at this stage in life okay so i know the book that really helped with the whole maybe me understand self help which was um louise hayes how to heal your life oh yes Every, oh. we all loved louise didn't we we oh of- so much and you know a, a friend of mine gave it to me um, and it was one, I was just like, wow, this is phenomenal. Uh, and I re- it was really easy to digest and, it, you know, and it all made so many aha kind of moments. I mean, he gave it to me and then I ended up buying it, well, lending it to so many people and they'd love it so much. I was like, I'll oh, just have it. I mean, honestly, I can't tell, I must have bought at least a dozen copies of that blooming book for me, lent it to someone and then go, just have it. Yes, <laughs> gift it to someone. It's been one of those sort of books. So, yeah, so that was a, gra- a great start and, and uh, of, of getting into being interested. I've always been quite interested in sort of spirituality um yeah well it's it's a it's a good thing to be connected to it was interesting because i did an interview with laura logic who was um in x-ray specs and you know the the experience of being in the band x-ray specs she sort of went and became a krishna and has been there ever since actually so um and that kind of saved her life was the you know living in that community and being part of that scene so um i think it's important and i there was another band who which i was really surprised with johnny h jazz one of the one of the they just kind of went i actually have had enough i'm just gonna form a drumming group in bristol i think and just sort of get back to nature and sort of just get my brain because it's just a very <laughs> odd world of just yeah. and and there was another there was a poet who was this million pound poet who um Yes, he said that when the fame thing happened, he just went into the woods and um, didn't come out. He he said he built himself a bar and and just stayed there until he felt <laughs> sane enough to come out of the woods. Because it was just, I think that kind of world is just, it just leaves you feeling a little bit peculiar and you need to yeah. kind of ground yourself. And I guess when you're in that, you're, you're, your feet aren't always that grounded. 
No, I mean, you know, I would say that um, whilst I love being like a pop star, I'd still say I still kind of had my feet on the ground, like, because otherwise I, w- I would have no place in my family. I don't mean it's like they wouldn't have shunned me, but I I, I was always, you know, still very much a family person. Um, and, you know, I'd still be sort of going and, oh, you know, going, going out with my parents and walking the dog and picking up dog muck. You know, I mean, I've, I've never, like, became too too good for any of those, too posh to whatever. Um, so, but still it is nuts. It is a, it is a, a crazy, crazy world and the expectations of you and, you know, it's just nice to get a bit of a, a, a breather and get some balance and re-look at who you want to be creatively as well as a, just a human being. Well, yes, absolutely. It's um, it's uh, it's fascinating. So then you you sort of had Vix and the in this uh, the mis- mischiefs. Before that, I had Vix and the Kicks actually as well, which was like a, a rock pop um, band, which was great. Uh, it, um, we did some stuff over in uh, like Dubai and Bahrain and um, toured all of the the UK. They were a great band. Um, but I had seven different lineups, and then I thought, oh, I'll just give up on this for a bit. It was just so hard, you know. Somebody I don't know would move away, or or um, decide they didn't want to do it, or start a degree, or get pregnant, or just well, you know. It was just so hard to keep doing. We we supported, um, we did tours with the Whalers, uh, the Christians supported Paul Weller. Um, great. I was sitting next to him on the plane. He was the right car, as I tell you. Wow, that's <laughs> fantastic. Yes. Getting more more and more drunk and lecherous and the people, I was like, oh, my God, I don't, I, I'm going to have to ask to move. <laughs> it, just, it started off really great, like really kind of connected on music. And I thought, oh, God, this is so cool, sitting next to Paul Weller. Um, and then because he'd asked it, it somehow behind my back like changed my seat um so that it, i'd sit by him but then all his like um crew were saying just don't worry one more drink and he'll be gone and i was like oh god if it's not i'm gonna have to because <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to drive me mad now um, but then yeah he conked out so we were all right <laughs> there you go yes life life in the world of uh showbiz so when that band finished you got vix and the kicks that was Vix and the Kicks, and then I had this Vix and the Mischiefs. Cheesy, crazy. It's kind of, there's a lot, aren't there? And now, yeah. Robin George. And you've got yeah. this new single that's coming out. So with all these bands... That, and there's all been these... quite a few reunions with the Fuzzbox stuff as well that's often sort of got in, you know, in, in the way as such. Like, I mean, with Vix and the Mischiefs, that was that was going really well. Did some great festivals, you know, a lot of rootsy festivals and Americana festivals and so on. We were doing pretty, pretty good, some... A really nice video that I produced, um, which is called Fame is Your Driver, which I thought was really cool. Uh, um, yeah, check it out on YouTube. Yes. Uh, but yeah, but then sort of the first box reunion thing came up again, so that got shelved a bit. So uh yeah. But now um yeah, so I mean Robin, George and I have sort of worked with each other on and off throughout the years anyway. Um, but he's my brother in law. <laughs> right. I introduced him to my sister and bingo. There we go. And um as we've said, unfortunately, a couple of months ago he passed away, but he was working on this project with me until literally like a day or two before before he passed. He really wanted me to release um Summertime Reggae Rule, which we have sort of done before, but re- release it properly um through the, the channels and he'd be featuring. So it was really nice because it, it it meant a lot to my sister as well. And we wanted to have like that kind of go out with a bang with a big summery, happy single to see him off with, really. Yes. Well, that's well, out to the moment. Yeah. That is out. Yeah, no, it sounds yeah, fantastic. And you put a lot, of, a lot of work into all those remixes as well, which is quite amazing. There's more. So the ones that I think are out at the moment are the single version and then there's a swing mix, which I really like. It's got a nice kind of groove. And then there's an acoustic electric. But he's got loads. He's got loads where he's got extra guitar solos. And so if anyone wants more mixes, we can certainly send you've them. Got, you've got a lot of mixes. Mm. And you've done those 80, are they 80s or 90s um, festivals that they have. I think you even played in Norwich, you know, last year or two years ago at Earlham Park. 
the fuzz we, box. We did all of the. Um, so just Maggie and I went out in kind. Of, we've done quite a few over recent years, but 2016 was a really good year. We did. Oh, we, we um, had an, a full electric band toured with um, the Wonder Stuff and um, Bentley Rhythm Ace and stuff. So that was really cool. We'd had another. Uh, reunion back in 2010 and then Maggie and I just the two of us have gone out and done quite a lot of you know kind of with backing tracks and then played some live instruments and, and vocals on top uh with the let's rock retro things and the pontins so yeah it's it's, it's fun it's fun um I mean I'm, I'm still up for doing some bits and bobs as and when but you know I it is nostalgic for me. It's not who I am, what I am now necessarily. Well, it's part of who I am because I like hanging it up and camping it up a bit. And perhaps, yes, but I, I've got a lot of my own like stuff on the go now. Yes. So, what, what are you doing now? Um, sort of going forward because obviously, for well, you know, Robin not being here. So, have you got musical kind of plans for the next twelve months? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, I've, I've got my little happy life business as well. So I'm doing, I do coaching and I do music workshops and I work a lot with in like mental health hospitals, um, community music settings and so on. So I do a lot of stuff like that as well. Um, and I, I, I really want to keep going. Uh, often it's it's either music or well being or well being or both. So I often use both together um, to help, you know, songwriting and so on. But, um, yeah, I'm going to actually have a new crowdfunding platform sort of set up soon. Well, I'll, I'll be on the platform. I'm not setting up the platform. No. I think I'm probably going to go with Indiegogo. Uh, so I'll, I'll be putting that out. And you, it'll probably be under Vic's Fuzzbox initially and then see how, see what I want to put it out as. But, yeah, I've got an album. Oh, God, I've got... Albums and albums written, but <laughs> this this album will be will be very different, very cool. Will you be bringing some musicians in for this as well, or is it? Well, I've been working with um, a producer who's also a musician and also like a percussionist drummer. So it's mainly the three of us. Um, but oh, it's just great. It's like you know, sort of the themes of life and well-being and mental health and relationships it's 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 a real journey oh fantastic this is my all dream would be to do a video uh like album oh, God. Yeah. would be perfect god mm. this is this is good so you've got the material and you just need to get the funding and then you're away we're still going to start putting it out anyway but i think i can do more and i you know i I've really enjoyed having when I've done the crowdfunding platforms for all of my like projects. I've, I've done one for you know we've done them for Fuzzbots, we've done them for I did it for Vixen the Mischiefs and for Vixen the Kicks. And it's the way that you interact with the audience, like with your fans, is lovely, and they get to get special stuff, you know, like sign things and you know really original merch or whatever they whatever they want. So it's really nice. But yeah, it, get, it gets kind of without a label, it gets funds on board where you can do some more creative, exciting things and provide them with some opportunities. And Pete, God, that's just, this is all very exciting. Yes, oh. I know because actually it's kind of weird because I guess Tina. And poor Joe and Joe passed away. That must it must be kind of looking back is often a bit weird because it's it's not that easy sometimes, is it? Realizing that um yes, yes, not everyone, yeah. There's you start as you get older. Um, yes, people passing away is, is quite yeah. a humbling moment. I really. mean, Joe was um, you know, but that was, was over ten years or something ago now, isn't it? And um yeah that was a, a real surprise I mean what was really lovely is that we'd just done the reunion tour where there was me Maggie and Joe the original members Tina, Tina didn't want to continue with music so that's fair enough um and then we had two other uh, musicians and we kicked ass and it was really nice to go that was 2010 it was just really nice to go and say yes yeah, see we can do it you know this whole sort of fuzzbots can't sing can't play well I think we can <laughs> so it was nice to go and kick ass and that was just be you know not long before Joe got really ill and passed away. So at least we'd had that. Yes. Well, it's nice to have some sort of completion sometimes. Did you yeah. say you're also looking at um, a book as well? Have you started thinking of documenting this fascinating career? Yeah, the, uh, the book about Fuzzbox is because is, we're still the UK's most successful all girl band and who play instruments, obviously, not just like sing. Um, and yeah, it's been written with a guy called Martin Tracy. 
he's done he's um also writing a book about it was with Robin George and that was about him. He's an author himself, does a lot of kind of um crime sort of stuff. Um and uh yeah, he's, he's quite a, quite a mover and a shaker, a really brilliant local guy. He's done a book about like Duran Duran photos with Maggie Demond. Um there, there's a, a TV well a, a documentary a, what would it be? Some sort of film um, about Birmingham talent that's got all the major names in it that that he's interested, he's, he's involved in as well. Oh, was there photographs of you recently at some launch? Yeah. And that was him? Yeah, yeah. So he's, um, so that's really nice. So um, I guess that'll be next year probably now. Fantastic. But, so are you just writing the... more things? Yeah, so you just need to you need to sort of compile all these things. Yeah, so it's your story with him co-writing it, so to speak. Me and Maggie, yeah. So we we were originally going to sort of write it ourselves, and we started that way. But then um, I don't know. Just somehow it's ended up really it being more Martin interviewing us and then kind of writing it up, which mm. I, I really liked the idea of it being very conversational. Yes, well, absolutely. And yeah. and so is it the case that you and Maggie are still doing projects together or were you doing separate things with this book? Um, now, uh, well, she's got a few other things on the go as well, and I have. So I, I, I think probably not at the, as things stand. Yes, no, when you said that, because I thought you were going to be doing the book, but not you and But so it's it's kind of... <laughs> I'm trying to so yes he's got the project and you two are feeding into the project to yes. do the fuzz box I've got you that's all very good <laughs> yes it's it's good anyway no I love it because I know that so many people like you well obviously you mentioned Rob Lloyd but Shen, the Shen from the the very things did a book recently and there's been films on different albums and different bands from the indie world that somehow you know can get a bit confused could get lost but you know even someone did a, bu- a book on the adrian borland and the sound and again it's like oh i'm so pleased because actually i think what people created in the 80s was absolutely amazing and and it and it just sort of gets pushed because the story of the 80s was very much you know it was a live aid it was duran duran it was it was you know it was very you know straightforward and then there's all these other different layers and i think it's been fantastic that people have um started to sort of put their story and narrative into the decade as well as you know doing new projects as well and i hope it's inspiring to you know to women but also to just people who just want to get out and just do it you know don't think about it too much you know be different be unique and you know we've got an interesting story and loads of fun stupid things and you know it, there's so much to cover like all the sort of silly side but also the real proper muso side the personal side that you know as young women going through and teen what well, girls you know school girls as we started so you know it, it's there's a lot there's a lot of and interactions with other famous people and all the journey is pretty fantastic. Well, so yes. I it's, I'm really glad to share it. It must be lovely, actually, ish, seeing those, um, yes, articles in newspapers, or yeah, well, the NME, Melody Maker, people like that, and seeing seeing those interviews and seeing those photographs must be quite special. Yeah, yeah, really nice. I mean, thankfully, I, I'm a bit of a hoarder on that front. My mum used to keep all the scrapbooks. Uh, and so I've got, I've got loads of all that stuff. Got a lot. Well, that's brilliant. Well, look, thank you ever so much for your time. Oh, and thank you. So I hope this all goes well for your next uh, musical journey and everything like that. Yeah. And do check out if you can find when John Peel reads a letter. Yeah, I've got, I've got a little note here. Because <laughs> actually it. somebody does do quite a good job documenting the John Peel show when a mm. band's been played and I could see that Christ, you got played a lot in the eighties, didn't yes. you? Yes. Um, there's a we've got a fabulous guy as well called Dan, and he runs the Fuzzbox fan page just on his own. He just, he just started it, and they're like, "Who is this person?" Um, and he's involved in some of my other projects and things. We've, got, we've become good pals. He's lovely. He will be able to find this out. He, um, he knows way more about me and my history and about fuzz box and dates and he finds things i'm like really I didn't oh know well that. we'll give it to dan <laughs> dan, will. <laughs> dan will definitely and you'll um I'm yes you'll man. work out who wrote this letter that john yes right yeah. reads out anyway look have a lovely 
Have a lovely day, evening, and um, yes, best of luck for uh, the future. But anyway, thank, thank you, you ever so much. Thanks. That was a really lovely to speak to you. Yes, take care. Take care. See you later. Bye-bye. 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 This is the end of the interview. A massive thanks to Vix for giving me the time for that. Um, yes, as I said, there's various social media platform sites to find out more about the band and what is happening um, in their life and career. And also, as I mentioned, there's a new single that has just come out as well. This has been the C86 Show, David East. So if you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. And all these interviews have been archived. Aren't you lucky? You can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbeam. Check it out. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.